I could talk to you about social innovation. I could talk to you about Google.org. I could talk to you about Goldman Sachs. But I wanted to talk to you about something that has been the most important thing that I think I've done in my life, which is set up a nonprofit with my brother and sister called IndyCore. The reason we set up IndyCore was we believed that the diaspora, the Indian diaspora from around the world, could reconnect to their heritage through service. We wanted to inspire a new generation of leaders who understood communities, who understood who they were, who understood what they were doing to make a difference in the world around them. Not just in India, but wherever they went, whether it was back in the US, whether it was in the UK, whether it was in Australia or South Africa. Wanted them to believe by understanding communities and by understanding what they could do, they could make change. So what do we do? We put together all of our savings, which for the three of us added up to $50,000, and we put in and started a nonprofit. My brother, who had just graduated from college and had been working at a charter school in Boston, came home and said, well, I'm just going to move to India. So that kicked my sister and I into gear. I was working for the Department of Treasury. Actually, I was working for Steve Radlett. My sister was a US attorney in San Diego. She called up all her friends and said, help us put a structure together to create a nonprofit. Help us figure out the legal structures. I called up all my development friends and said, help us design the program. Help us select the fellows. Help us create the application process. And we went into gear. We went to India. We visited projects. We figured out how to organize a program. It was a one-year fellowship, not a six-month fellowship, because we believed after talking to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, after talking to the Peace Corps, after talking to various corps that existed in the country, that a year was a minimum. Because in order to understand how to make change in the communities, you had to at least be there a year. We were afraid to do two years because we were afraid that would knock people out. People wouldn't come if they saw it was for two years. So that's what we did. As you see, we looked a lot younger then. We're a lot older now. But we went and we got started. And that was probably the most important thing we did. We just got started. We just did it, Steve. But we had to believe, because you see, the three of us, when we work together, we fight like cats and dogs. If you know me, you know I have an opinion. Multiply that by three, that's three of us with a lot of opinions. We fought about the logo. We fought about the website. We fought about who did what. We fought about who was in charge at any point in time. But what we learned is we learned how to believe in what we wanted to do. Because when we got started, the Indian officials, they thought we were nuts. Why would people come to a country that had left? At that time in India, 13 years ago, people were trying to get out as fast as possible. Why would smart people want to come live in a village for one year? You're wasting your time. Don't waste it here. The villagers thought we were crazy because they didn't think people actually could live there for a year. They didn't think it was possible to live there for a year. The funniest were the parents. The parents would be like, you're wasting my kid's time. You're going to ruin my kid's life. They're about to become a doctor. They're going to law school. They're going to be an engineer. They got grad school. They're getting their MBA. You're ruining my kid's life. 50% of the parents every year would call us and say, why are you trying to ruin my kid's life? And our answer? was never in your lifetime are you going to look back and say, God, I wish I had worked one more year. You're not going to get there and say, God, I wish I worked 55 years instead of 54 years. <laughs> it's just a year of your life, but it's a year that will transform your life. We were all over India. We weren't in one place. We were in every part of India. When we first started, we visited 250 projects before we picked our first 10. We wanted to find those change makers in the communities that were having impact. We wanted to find those people that were doing things that we didn't think was possible. We didn't go to the large organizations because they didn't really need us. We didn't go to these organizations that were too small because they didn't know how to take human capacity. They didn't know how to do it. They couldn't manage it. We found those mid-sized organizations that had been working in communities that knew what to do, that could take a capacity and make things happen, that could make change happen. We worked on building toilets. We helped schools. We worked in public health. We even did fun things. We created a musical. 
for kids in the slums so they could build their own confidence. We built street schools. We didn't build them, actually. We just sat on a corner where the kids were, and we ran schools. We created a little movement on hand washing. We started in one corner with some kids, taught them how to cut their nails and wash their hands, asked them to come with us to the next set of kids. Next thing you know, throughout the city, every kid was doing that to the next kid. But what mattered was that we were all over India. We were there when the tsunami happened. We were there when the earthquake happened. We helped rebuild homes. We helped clean up after the tsunami. What did we want to achieve? We wanted people to strive for their best, no matter how hard it got. And boy, it got hard. Many people wanted to come home after three months. We wanted them to work as hard as possible, because if you could make it there, you can make it anywhere else. We wanted the communities to aspire that they, too, could make change. Not to just accept that it is what it is, but you could be part of that change. You can make the change happen to yourself. We wanted our fellows to admire the communities and their resilience. You see, as hard as our lives are, the fact is, we got to come back after a year. They lived it every single day. To know that they could still walk three kilometers, get water, come back, finish up that little bit of water, go back again, and walk three kilometers to get water and come back, we wanted to understand and appreciate that resilience. We wanted innovation to happen between the intersection of the fellows and the communities. Innovations happening every single day around the world. We just don't choose to see it. We wanted that innovation. We wanted to find it. We wanted to make it happen. We wanted to transform lives, both of the communities and the people that went. And more importantly than anything else, we wanted people to believe that change was possible. But that required immersion in communities. It wasn't just about going and experiencing it. It was about living it. So we had some rules. We're probably one of the hardest organizations to come work for. Rule number one, you can't drink the whole time you're there. No alcohol. Seems easy to say. I'm glad you could do really good parties here. But you have to give it up for a year. Because when you're living in those communities, at least one parent was an alcoholic. How do you tell a child that you sh their parents shouldn't drink when you're doing it? They don't know the difference between one drink, two drinks, or three drinks. If we can't live it, we can't talk about it. No fraternizing. Same concern. Kids didn't know the difference between when you were friends and when you weren't friends. They didn't understand it. We had some marriages afterwards, don't worry. Just couldn't do it while you were there. And third, we gave a stipend of 1,000 rupees a month. In today's dollars, that's $17 a month. You had to live on $17 a month because that's what the communities were living on. If you could do that, you could do anything. And that's where the innovation, inspiration, and everything happened. So in the process, we learned a lot. We learned humility. We learned what we didn't know. We learned what we did know. We learned the assumptions we were making about other people. We had a fellow working in a village where Bangladeshi refugee community was. They were located in southern India. They spoke a different language called Bengali. She spoke the southern language. She was teaching them how to build toilets. Could not speak the language at all. But they managed to figure out how to build these toilets. One of the farmers who she'd become friends with was invited to go speak in one of the African countries to teach them about organic farming. And she said to the farmer, how are you going to go teach there? You can't speak the language. He looked at her and said, what about you? You're here. You learn a little bit of humility in that process. But what he learned from her was also that she could do it, so could he. And that's hard to learn. We understood communities. We understood what was going on. We understood what was happening. That understanding mattered a lot, because if you knew what was going on on the ground, you could make change. We had to be entrepreneurs. $17 a day isn't a lot of money, but you can make change happen on $17 a day. If you aren't entrepreneurial, you were going to miss out. It required entrepreneurship. All of that didn't matter if we couldn't collaborate. 
You had to talk to the villagers. You had to talk to the communities. You had to talk to the elders. You had to talk to the local government. You had to talk to the national government, and you had to talk to the NGOs. To make change, you had to talk to all of them. In, that, in those intersections is where we had innovation. And sometimes those innovations weren't products. We didn't build things necessarily. We didn't make things necessarily. Sometimes the innovation was just a process. Teaching a community that they could write a letter to their state, to the national government, and get their supplies. We had a fellow that was working in a village where the law allowed them to have access to medication, vaccines, as well as vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiencies in kids create night blindness. And vaccines, as you all know, are important. They were supposed to have them. Gave them a little checklist, said, go check in your community clinics. Do you have them or do you not have them? By teaching them to write that letter, they figured out what their own power was, because within two weeks, all those medications were in their clinics. It wasn't an innovation in the sense that we would think about or call an innovation. The innovation was teaching them their own power, teaching them that they can ask for change. So you would ask, what's the impact? What kind of impact have you had in India? Because, you know, I live in that world. Are we having macro impact? Are we having micro impact? We have lots of impact. We had project impact. We made toilets. We built water pipes. We built homes. We taught women how to become entrepreneurs. We taught them to sell their goods. They now run their own businesses. Children are running businesses. Children are making greeting cards. We had lots of project impacts, and we can go into those. We had impact that we didn't even think about. We created an ultimate Frisbee league in the town, that, in the city that we were living in, just to teach kids how to play with each other. We wanted people across faiths to play, across economic classes to play. That ultimate Frisbee league today competes not only throughout India, but it competes internationally. You could not have bet that people in India were going to play ultimate frisbee. The first frisbees came from anyone that donated them. We had people volunteer from the US, from the UK, to come teach ultimate frisbee. And then the other impact we had, which was we did not expect, was that service became a meme. 35 organizations now exist in India that offer service programs. 50% of our applicants five years ago started to be Indians in India who wanted to serve. These were people that told us, why are you coming back? Everybody's trying to leave. And we had fellows who started some of those programs. Some of them have stayed in India. One has been there at least 12 years. She's still running those street schools. She's still working in communities, and she's still helping women become entrepreneurs. But let me give you a couple of things that some of our fellows have said and the impact on them, because to us, this is the immeasurable ones. One of our fellows says she learned real-world education through service. Today, 10 years later, it's the most authentic and grounded experience, life compass. Rish got his MBA after he came back. He didn't even think it was worth coming, wasn't sure if it was worth coming. At that time, he said it was an idealistic platform to develop and express deeper values. Today, he says it's a personal high watermark to hold himself against. Bindi. She's now in public health, putting into action Be the Change when it was the hardest. Today, it is a life-changing journey, which she's still on. Christina Matthews, in changing the world, I changed myself. Today, it's a reminder to live life fearlessly. So why service, and why does it matter? Talked about it a little bit. But service provides an understanding. It provides an understanding of not only communities, it provides an understanding of ourselves and who we are. Can we make things happen when it's hard? It's easy to say, I just need more money. It's harder when you have to make it happen because you don't have it. It provides connectedness. We begin to understand where the breakdowns are. We begin to understand each other. We begin to ask questions of each other. How do we do it? What do you do? What would you do? How would you think about it? It teaches us humility. In fact, I think one of the biggest things that we've learned is as much as we thought we were giving, the communities we were living in were giving us even more. One of our fellows had been working in the city that we were living in, in the slums for a long time. There was a woman that used to sell these little piggy banks in carts. And if you've ever been to India, you're like, there's a lot of these uh, people selling things on carts. Everything she sold that day was what she had for food that night. 
She gave him one of those piggy banks, and he said, let me give you money. She said, no, you're like my son. I don't need your money. He took, it. He took the piggy bank, filled it up, gave it back to her the next day. Ten years later, he went to go visit her, just last year, and she still had not opened up that piggy bank. She didn't want the money. She really did think he was like her son. So as much as we have, as much as we want to give, when we give a dollar, we think twice about it. When we give five dollars, we want to know what the metrics are. That was her keep. That's what we learned when we learned humility. Service focuses innovation. We keep wanting to build things and want people to want them. But innovation for what they need, that's different. It focuses it, it makes it clear, it helps us figure out what innovation is. More importantly, it sets our moral compass. It is who we are. For me, it has been probably the most authentic journey I have been on. Everything that I have done since then, whether it's work at the White House, whether it's work at Google, whether it's work at Goldman, everything has been set by what Indicor taught us. It is about the humanity. It is about people. It is about what people have taught us. For my sister and brother, it's the same. My brother ran Indicor for five years, then started as a new project out of Indicor, which was a water project, water ATMs for rural communities. He ran that for another five years. Most recently, just about a year ago, a big car company made a huge investment in it to scale that project. He now works for that car company. But Indicor is his grounding, and it's what, his, what creates him and what keeps him real. My sister embodies in decor. For her, she is the, the soul of it lives in her. She talks to the fellow. She keeps up with it. She makes sure everything's happening. And now she is a professor. At the, she is a professor, assistant dean at the University of Michigan Law School. It taught us to remember that humanity guides our authenticity. In Luke 12, 48, it says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. By virtue of the fact we are in this room, we have been entrusted with much, and we have been given much. The question is, how do we decide to use it? I believe, we believe, that we have the power to be that change. My question to you is do you believe that you can be that change? Thank you.